Well, welcome this week to the Cultivate Podcast. My name is Trey. I am the Executive Director at Mercy View, and I host the podcast, often co-hosted with our lead pastor, Brad Andrews, but he is out this week. And so I am running a what's going to be a short solo episode of the podcast this morning, just to briefly recap the sermon that I had a chance to preach on Sunday in our counterculture series regarding technology. This past Sunday, we dove into what is probably the seemingly lightest topic of our series and started talking about technology and how we use it and what that use looks like and what it's designed for. And the big gist of the sermon was that we need in our day and age a kind of wisdom in our approach to the technologies in our lives. Technology is something that's always been with us. It's something that we've always had at our disposal. I made the point to say that from the moment Adam picked up the first stick to use as a garden tool, humanity's been using technology. And so from a biblical worldview, the thing that has to undergird our use of technology no matter how primitive we might think it is, is a kind of wisdom. We need to know what it's for. We need to know how to use it in a way that's going to glorify and honor God. And so the big case that I made on Sunday was that creation, first and foremost, is a gift and a tool from God that has been given to us so that we, as God's image bearers, can actually fulfill the mission that God has given to us. What is that? Well, the mission that God gave to us is found in the beginning of Genesis. It's there in Genesis 1 when God says to uh, man after creating us that we're to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. He gave us dominion over all of creation. And in order to exercise dominion, we need tools in our hands. It's not possible to cultivate a civilization apart from tools. And technology, first and foremost, is a tool. But all tools can be used for good and for ill gains. They can be used for things that are going to increase the glory of God in the earth, and they can be used for things that are going to detract and distract from it. And so what we have in front of us when we think about technology is a tool that should be used, but it should be used for, ultimately, God's glory. Now, most of us, when we think about technology, are thinking about most likely what it is you're listening to this podcast on right now, our smartphones. We're thinking about the way in which that we use that. And that's still a tool. Sometimes in conversation, we might bemoan the fact that there no longer is a time for us to pause and think more deeply about things. I was talking with someone the other day about how if I need to know something, I can just pull out my phone and Google it. But, you know, 20 years ago, that was impossible. If you didn't know who sang this song, then You had to hope that the person with you did, or that when the song was over, the radio host told you who that song was by. Now you don't need that. You have access to that information at all times. And that can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. As we think about our phones, we think about those as technology that is good, or at least can be good, We need to think about what wisdom looks like in approaching that. And so one of the things that I thought about, one of the sources that I read as I was getting ready to preach this Sunday, we didn't really talk about it on Sunday, was a piece from Jake Meter at the website Mere Orthodoxy, where he thought for a moment in a short piece that he wrote back in June about what it would look like if we didn't have our phones in public worship. What if we oriented our time with the people of God in such a way that our phones weren't in our hands? It's a thought experiment that he 
had, and he, he says, hey, this comes from a recent piece out of The Atlantic by Jonathan Haidt, and where Jonathan and his co-author spent some time thinking about uh, not allowing phones in school. And so he wanted to think about what that looks like in the church. And he has some necessary caveats, he says, up front, where he says he doesn't support any kind of plan where churches have some sort of ecclesiastical bouncers at the door confiscating phones. Uh, in our world, we live on our phones. In reality, we know most of us, many of us, are addicted to our phones. And, and it wouldn't make sense to have someone at the door taking phones. What if a stranger comes? able to not have our phones in our hands or in our possession at every single moment in the worship service. And he plays through an entire scenario of what that would look like. And, and it would actually require a kind of change from us as a church. Because it would require a kind of change from you and I in the way that we think about what happens when we walk into that sanctuary on Sunday? I, I've been thinking about this personally in my own life. Why do I find it necessary to always have my phone at a reasonable distance from my hand? Why do I find it so necessary at times to pull my phone out in service? What, what would it look like? If I was able to prioritize in my time gathering with the people of God, putting that away, whether that's in my bag that I bring to church on Sunday morning or in my wife's purse, what, what if instead of first and foremost thinking about having the luxury of my Bible in digital form, I actually prioritized making sure that my physical copy of the scriptures was with me. Or just relying on the Bibles that we have under the chairs each Sunday morning. How would not even being able to react to the impulse, because it's there, to grab my phone and look at something, how would that change what it means to meet with the people of God? Even if I'm able to not grab my phone during the worship or the preaching, which if you're like me, probably isn't true. Then what would it look like to just not be thinking about it as I'm carrying on conversation with people before and after church? To not think about the next thing that's coming up on the to-do list, whatever the next task might be in our life, the thing that we have to do. What if our time with the people of God was spent together. That's one way we can think about wisdom in our technological use. And then there's, there's other ways, too, that wisdom comes into play. I think really, in particular for parents, when we think about technology, we not only need to think about the way in which we use technology with our kids, we need to think about the way in which we help them begin to cultivate their own wisdom in use of technology. I mentioned on Sunday that the book The TechWise Family by Andy Crouch was a great resource for parents who are trying to figure out, okay, how do I use technology with wisdom with my kids? How do I introduce them wisely to that? And, and there were 10 commitments that his family has made that he writes in this book that he suggests for others to make. Um, and I only listed six of those because all ten of them are, are rather daunting, and there wasn't time to add a little bit of context in the sermon on Sunday. But I want to read those ten and, and give a little bit of thought behind it. And as you hear some of them, you go, okay, I understand why on Sunday he didn't read all of these because it's a lot to lay on you in a sermon on Sunday. And especially when you consider the fact that you probably aren't doing some of these and thinking about how to do some of these would probably seem impossible. I know it would does for us. But the first commitment is that we develop wisdom and courage together as a family. 
It's pretty straightforward. Wisdom, courage, those are things that we do together. And what does that have to do with technology? Well, it, the whole point on Sunday was that technology is about uh, using the tools and gifts God has given us with wisdom. And so this is acknowledging that we cultivate that wisdom together. Their second commitment was they want to create more than they consume. So we talked about this on Sunday. For them, it means filling the center of their home with things that reward skill and active engagement. And he goes into detail in the book about what that is. Uh, That's things like learning to play instruments or learning to create different things. I was talking the other day at our gospel community about how you know, one of the ways that I've tried to do this is I try to help my, let my kids help me do certain things, learn to do specific things, such as uh, we created a table for our couch a couple of weeks ago. Me and my son, who's four, went out and we sanded down the wood and we screwed it all together and we stained it. And he helped me in that process create something in a moment when it would be really easy to just let him watch whatever he wants on TV. And the third thing was they design. Uh, a rhythm of work and rest into their life. And so they practice this by one hour per day, one day per week, and one week a year, turning off their devices. And they use the time to worship, feast, play, and rest together. The fourth commitment they have is that they wake up before their devices and they go to bed before their devices. So their phone's not the first thing they grab in the morning. And it's not the last thing they see before they go to sleep. There's some real wisdom in that, particularly for our kids, but definitely for us too. There's wisdom in making sure that we're not cultivating a kind of affection for devices in our kids by letting it be the thing that fixates them from sunrise to sunset. The fifth one is one that I left off the list because this one's really hard. Their aim is for no screens before double digits at school and at home. And when they say no screens, they mean none. They don't have a TV in their home. It's not in the center of their home. And their aim is not to begin allowing screen time until their kids are at least 10 years old. I didn't mention that on Sunday because that seems like one that most of us probably have not even come close to doing. My 14 month old loves Bluey because she sees Bluey on the TV. And so that seems like a daunting thing for me to be able to pull the TVs out of my house and not let my kids see those. What am I going to do now? Obviously there's something that we could do other than that, but it's still a scary thing. And And there's ways in which we can think wisely about maybe the kind of screens our kids are using. Maybe the, amount of time that they're using those screens and use a kind of wisdom and a kind of and get a kind of benefit like what Andy is talking about here. The sixth one is we use our screens for a purpose and we use them uh, together rather than using them aimlessly and alone. That's really, really helpful insight. The seventh one is that car time is conversation time. So instead of a podcast or instead of if your kids are old enough to have their own devices, them being on their devices in the car, you intentionally take that time to talk with them, to to cultivate conversation and generate engagement with your children. Number eight was that spouses have one another's passwords and parents have total access to their children's devices. Our technological lives aren't kept secret from one another. The ninth one, I left this off on Sunday because this one is a good one, but it it seemed to just be something that was a little less important to highlight. We learn to sing together rather than letting recorded and amplified music take over our lives and worship. I think that the point of that is that it's, it's really easy to allow that recording and someone who can sing well Overtake the joy of being able to do that communally together, particularly when we're thinking about family worship. Even if you can't carry a tune in the bucket, 
there's something joyous about singing with your kids, and there's there's some wisdom that's being cultivated in turning our hearts together toward the Lord in that way. And then the tenth commitment, I didn't say this on Sunday because it just seemed to not fit at the moment, but we show up in person for the big events of life. We learn how to be human by being fully present at one at our moments of greatest vulnerability. We hope to die in each other's arms. And what he's getting at in this is that technology, for all the ways that it seems to want to tell us that it's there to help us connect, it really does help drive us into a kind of seclusion. And what they're committing to, and I think what God would have for us, is that we're together. We're present with one another. We're in one another's space, learning to love one another and learning to love the Lord as we interact with one another. We show up for those big events. You show up for the ball game. You show up for the dance. You show up for the wedding. And you show up for the funeral. Because no matter what our technological advances might be, and whatever our age that we move into beyond this one looks like, what it's going to require is that we as people and particularly as the people of God, learn how to live together and learn how to take dominion and exercise the cultural mandate to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it with wisdom by using the tools that God is so gracious to give us. Well, this week, if you enjoy the Cultivate podcast, I want to ask you to possibly leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find us, and uh, just let us know what you think about the podcast. If you have a suggestion for a podcast in the future, you can actually suggest topics on our website at mercyview.com slash the Cultivate Podcast. You can ask any question, and we may or may not tackle it, but we would love to hear from you. We would love to uh, just know that the folks who are listening are benefiting from this and uh, we're going to keep putting out content and uh, seeking to help our church grow in discipleship. And so until next time, we'll see you later.